The risk now for financial stability in the euro area is undoubtedly uh, the, the, the economic outlook. Uh, we have uh, a situation of low growth. Uh, we are not uh, ruling out the possibility of a technical recession. We have seen that uh, you know, this is the baseline scenario according to the projections of the European Commission, and simultaneously very high, high inflation. And, and uh, you know, on the other hand, as a response to high inflation, uh, monetary policy uh, all over the world is uh, tightening, is normalizing, and so we have a tightening of financing conditions. So the combination of low growth, uh, high inflation, tightening of financial conditions is the main factor behind uh, our, our fears no, with respect to the future evolution of uh, financial stability issues. Uh, many economists uh, compare the situation now to the, the situation in the, in the 70s of the last century. Would you say that's a fair comparison? I think that uh, you know, there are big differences. For instance, now in the Western world is much uh, less dependent on, 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 on oil than it was in, in, in the 70s. Uh, and I think that we know a little bit how we have to react. <laughs> Well, we, we always learn uh, from our mistakes in the, in the, in the past. No? And uh, I think that the response uh, in terms of monetary policy uh, has to be extremely focused on trying to avoid second round effects. You have an energy shock and you have a supply side shock. And uh, the real problem for the, for, the, for the economy is that inflation becomes entrenched and that inflation expectations start to be de anchored. So the question of credibility uh, about our commitment to reduce inflation is going to be key. But if you look at what trade unions are doing, we're already seeing second round effects. So uh, what is your assessment here? Uh, wage claims have been on the rise. That's quite clear. But uh, uh, the wage tracker that we follow uh, does not indicate that uh, wage claims now are excessive. It can, it can uh, you know, happen in the, in the, in the, in the future. If we do not send the message that we will be able to reduce inflation over the medium term. So I think that uh, the main factor that can, uh, uh, can uh, raise uh, wage claims in the, near, in the near future is that uh, uh, the credibility of a central bank is not uh, strong enough. So that's why we are making such a commitment with uh, you know, the price stability, our definition of price stability, and that we will do whatever is necessary in order to reduce uh, inflation to the level uh, that we consider as price stability, at least 2%. Of course, there's a lot of speculation where the terminal rate is for the ECB, and we recently had uh, Villora du Gallo, the French governor, saying it can be well above 2%. What is your assessment? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, 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 I try not uh, being pretentious in terms of knowing what's going to happen. The only thing that I can say is that, uh, well, we are going, we are going to, to, to raise rates until we are fully convinced that in the medium term inflation will converge to 2%. What's going to be the level? It will depend on many, on many, on many, on many factors, no? uh, and I think that uh, uh, that's the main message that, message that we should uh, convey to the, to the, to the population. But I think that these concepts of uh, neutral rate, terminal rate, uh, I think that are, are not very useful now, because uh, while there are the level of uncertainty that we have now in the marketplace, I think that we have to be very prudent. So I think that the correct approach is meeting by meeting, data dependent, and let's see, I, I understand perfectly that markets, they, they are demanding guidance, but uh, this is not a question of, uh, you know, giving the wrong guidance. I think that uh, what we, we will have uh, to say very clearly is that, uh, you know, we are going to do our job and that we will reduce inflation and that we will raise rates uh, that uh, are compatible until the level that is compatible with the convergence of inflation to our uh, price stability definition. Aneta joins us now from the ECB. Aneta, a really interesting interview there. Uh, coming with, of course, the clear indication that fighting that inflation figure right up until it hits 2% is still the mark, no matter how much impact that has on things like growth. Yes, exactly. I think that's the clear message that uh, the ECB is willing to cannibalize growth for the sake of cutting down inflation to its target. And especially they are concerned about second round effects, which we are already witnessing, to be fair, in various economies, uh, such as here in Germany. If you look at what trade unions are demanding, second round effects are a reality. So um, what they, of course, want to avoid at all costs is that the inflation expectations are getting de-anchored because then, 
monetary policy cannot do an awful lot apart from raising rates and also uh, shedding their balance sheet. That will be part of the second part of the interview, what that QT project, quantitative tightening, uh, meaning selling assets from the ECB's balance sheet, will also mean for financial stability. Currently, of course, it's like the perfect storm for consumers, and that also could mean that we are going to see non-performing loans also when it comes to consumer credit going up, not only from uh, companies, which of course could happen as well, a wave of insolvencies given the recession risk we're facing in the Eurozone. So <clears throat> in the second uh, part of the interview, I've asked him what the ECB thinks about a rise of non-performing loans, what it means for the stability of the banking sector. Take a listen. The banks now, uh, they, they, have, uh, they have started to see an improvement in terms of profitability in the short term because the, the increase in interest rates is uh, widening the, the net interest margins and so the profitability is on the rise. Now the return on equity of banks is close to 8%. To but I think that we cannot uh, focus uh, and circumscribe ourselves only to that uh, event because, uh, you know, in the medium term, the situation will be, will be different. We will have a combination of uh, lower growth that is going to have an impact on corporates and the solvency of corporates, and simultaneously financing conditions uh, will, will continue tightening. So uh, they, and they should be, uh, let's say, cautious and prudent, and they should not be blinded by the short-term impact of raising rates. Uh, they should take into consideration that perhaps uh, you know, in some months uh, insolvencies will be on the rise, and even, you know, that uh, the repayment capacity of households will be affected. There is, there, are, there is a very positive factor, that is the evolution of the, of the labor market. The labor market, uh, now we are in an uh, all-time uh, low in terms of unemployment rates, and uh, employment continues, continues growing. But uh, uh, perhaps, you know, that will not uh, happen in the future. So it's, it's important to be, to be very prudent and to to, to put uh, provisions at a level that is consistent with these potential risks that are looming ahead. Yeah, the, the banking or uh, the mortgage system in the Eurozone is very different. So uh, from my understanding in Spain, for example, you have a lot of flexible rate mortgages. So are uh, those banks and or are those countries uh, more vulnerable because, of course, the consumer will feel the interest pain much earlier? No, I think that uh, you are totally right. We have a diversity and we have a, quite a lot, uh, quite a few disparities in the, in the euro area. It's totally, totally, totally right and totally true that, uh, for instance, in the case of Spain and in other countries as well, in Portugal and I think that in Italy, floating rates, mortgage, uh, mortgages at floating rates are much more uh, prominent and much more, much more common. So uh, this has, uh, you know, uh, a very clear impact in the first time and the increase in interest rates will be translated uh, to the to the asset side of the, of the balance sheet very rapidly. But simultaneously, well, that will, be, that will make households more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that you have to look at the two sides of the, of the coin. Not only you know, the short-term impact, but as well the potential, uh, the potential evolution of uh, you know, the capacity of households to, to repay their debts. I also have to ask you about crypto and what risk that poses to the financial stability in the Eurozone because we have seen, of course, a very prominent failure with FTX just recently. So um, how are you discussing that internally and what safeguards are in place? Well, we, 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 we will discuss it internally for sure that this is an element that we will, we will, we will discuss it for sure that uh, you know, now internally at the CV. We are uh, considering and analyzing, you know, what's happening. But I think that, uh, well, we have, been, we have been crystal clear with respect to cryptos in the past. We have made very clear warnings about uh, the lack of fundamentals of this kind of assets, the volatility that this could imply, the potential losses that could create, and the turmoil that uh, well, uh, this could create, you know, in the crypto, in the crypto space. So uh, mm, I think that uh, it was a question of time to see, uh, uh, you know, a transfer of, uh, 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 from this uh, volatility in terms of the assets to the, uh, to the trading platforms that uh, are the ones that are negotiating this kind of, uh, of trades. And this is what is happening now. I think that this is, uh, I hope that it will be, you know, a warning call about, uh, you know, this kind of investments. I think that it's very important to have, uh, you know, better regulation in terms of the defense of uh, consumers and investors. Uh, and simultaneously, and simultaneously, uh, well, what we see is that the impact is now circumscribed to the perimeter of the, of the crypto space, 
but uh, all the, the different segments of the, of, the, of, the, of the markets are intertwined at the end of the day. So uh, let's see, so far it's fully circumscribed to the crypto space, but uh, we cannot uh, rule out the possibility that uh, some links with other parts of the financial market is something that we have to monitor and we have to be uh, you know, quite attentive to, to these potential links. Um, when you talk to investors, are they concerned that something like a debt crisis could come back to Euro the Eurozone because of the disparities of the system, how the yield level is also evolving? Is that a concern to you and financial stability? Well, we have seen an increase in yields that has, been, uh, that has taken place for all the European countries. But, uh, and I would not say that it was a surprise, uh, what we have seen is that, uh, as well, what we have regarded is that the spreads have not been widening. If you look at the evolution, for instance, of bonds uh, with uh, the yields of uh, BDPs or Spanish bonds or uh, whatever, uh, well, the increase in yields has been, over the last three months, for instance, quite similar. So there is not, uh, let's say, uh, a widening of spreads that is an early indication of a fragmentation. And the reason, in my view, is that, uh, uh, well, the kind of accidents that we had, for instance, in the case of the UK with uh, the minute budget have not taken place uh, in, in Europe, and I hope that that will not take place in Europe. And simultaneously, that we have, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, approved, uh, you know, two anti-fragmentation instruments that I think that are going to be quite effective. The first one uh, is TPI that has not been used but can be activated in the future. And the second one is flexibility in the investment of the of the of, uh, uh, PPP, of our pandemic program that, uh, you know, just in case we can use it. Is a quantitative tightening a potential risk to that sort of semi calmness of the market? Well, uh, QT uh, uh, is always a question mark for central banks, not only for the, for, for the ECB, but uh, for all the central banks, because it's a new experience, let's call it that way. We have a track record with respect to, to, to increasing rates or reducing rates. Uh, well, uh, we, 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 uh, QT is the other side of the coin of uh, QE, <laughs> the, the expansionary and the expansion of the, of the balance sheet of the central banks. So uh, I think that uh, is going to take place in Europe. We will discuss it uh, in our next Monetary Policy Governing Council meeting. I think that uh, you know, we will decide uh, about the timing, about the sequencing, we will decide about the characteristics. My personal view is that we have to be, we have to be careful it has to take place, it has to be part of the normalization process of monetary policy, but simultaneously, given you know, the level of unknowns uh, with respect to the, to the potential consequences of, uh, of QT, I think that we have to do it very carefully. It should be a sort of passive QT and uh, you know, um, trying to, to, to uh, reinvest only a percentage of uh, the maturities of uh, you know, the bonds that we have in our portfolio in different uh, time horizons. So to sum it up, I think it's fair to say that financial risks have risen substantially for the euro area because of various factors. It's not only inflation, it's also the interest rates, but also crypto. So I guess the ECB is very vigilant about any uh, abrupt movements on the financial markets, which could actually endanger financial stability here in the euro area. With that, over to you.